time for episode 31 of Collider's Heroes. What's going on? I'm John Schnepp, and uh, we're going to be talking about the world of heroes and villains, cinematic, TV, series, and all that in between. And today we are going to be joined by our guest, Chris Gore, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for having me, John. Hey. Always a pleasure to come here. Awesome to have you back on Heroes once again. Uh, we're going to kick it right off. Uh, we had a great time. Both me and Gore were over at Stan Lee's Kamikaze, right. sweating it up with all y'all, you know, having fun at the, the L.A. Convention Center. That place was giant. Yeah, I mean, they split it up into two sides yeah. now. So you've got, like, you know, all the merch in one area, the stuff you can buy. And then they had, like, the other area, which was all the sort of, uh, that's where all the celebrities were right. for autograph signings. Then the upstairs were all the panels. I don't know. It was great. I mean, WonderCon's going to be there. In yeah. Uh, March. Yeah, that's so, fantastic. I mean, it's like there's, I, there's nothing against the Anaheim WonderCon, right. but I was surprised, and I was also it's closer to where I live, so I was like, hey, that's yeah. easier. So uh, looking save forward on hotel. to yeah, a lot of sweaty conventions for next year for us to go to. That's right. So, I really was impressed with the level of cosplay that was there. I mean, you know, uh, Kamikaze takes place over Halloween weekend, mm -hmm. so. Um, you, when you've got Halloween weekend already an excuse to dress up in costumes and then you've got, you know, uh, kamikaze happening the entire, it's not really counted as part of the space, but it's like the lobby just ends up being a place where all the photographers are taking pictures of the cosplay. I mean, it was insane. I saw a woman in a full Starship, original Starship Enterprise, but like she was in the center of it. Oh man. And it was like, she, it was, it must've been like nine feet long and she was just, and it was made from styrofoam. Wow. I, you couldn't, unless you got up really close, you could tell, but like it was badass. There was that. And then I saw a guy, I saw a guy in a Kylo Ren costume right. that said, that had a sign that said, I am not Luke. Which was it was it was cool, man. I yeah. like I like the creative costumes that kind of like take something and kind of mix it up. I like seeing like a bunch of the Jared Leto Jokers. I mean, I right, think I saw right. about fifteen. Not not kidding, like in just on Saturday alone, well, all deranged with all the tattoos. And I was like, the movie's not even out yet. And I'm so I'm happy to see people like you know embracing this new weirder Joker. You know, yeah. And then and then I also saw people dressed as the new Harley Quinn from Suicide totally. Squad. Uh, which I think is, most which is cool. I think that this is the most Harley Quinns I've ever seen, and it ran the gamut from the animated Harley Quinn to right. the Arkham Knight, like one with a super giant, like the leather outfit and like, the super big, you know, smashy pole, and like, and now we've got the the more creepier and um, uh, Margot Robbie styled right. Harley Quinn. So it's a no lose situation if you love Harley Quinn. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, a, no kidding. One of the greatest outfits ever created and characters. Cool. Yeah. So puddings, let's start up with number one. We are going to talk about Wolverine in the reshoots of X-Men Apocalypse. Um, they, the, we all knew that they were gonna do some pickups and reshoots, they're, they're going on in, in the next couple of weeks, but uh, some of the crew members actually said, and you Jackman's gonna be there for quite a long time, uh, I guess they're gonna add Wolverine, like we, we always thought Wolverine would be in there, uh, but now it's been confirmed. What do you think about Wolverine being a bigger part than just a cameo for X-Men Apocalypse? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, the whole X-Men series started with Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. He yeah. kind of set the tone coming into the world as an outsider, which I think was a great way to introduce the X-Men in the very first movie. And just having him carry through, if this is going to, if this is ki going to kind of be the end of the old school X-Men, I think it's perfect that he's in this. I mean, I was surprised when there were rumors that he may not have right. a big part. Although I have to say, like his one of the best moments from X Men First Class. Oh yeah, is the you know, is 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 his quick scene, which is just sort of a button, right. and you I didn't even know he was in it, which was right. great because so he's was, technically so, not in it. He's except not really for, in it. Yeah, but, but yeah. oh, he is in it, and yeah. you'll remember that scene. But I can't see how they could do this without Jackman. I mean, he really he's sort of like now sort of become like the Obi Wan Kenobi role of the X Men right. universe, right? I mean, so they're. Tr trying to mix like some of the old school and some of the, you know, the new school or sort of the new timeline. Right. Now that like certain people are not dead. So, so I'm excited, although I'm just a little concerned. The only thing that concerns me about this movie, I'm excited about, about Hugh Jackman having right. a larger role, that apocalypse costume. Right. Oscar Isaacs, what's up with that? See, it I looks don't, like a Mighty Morphin Power Ranger no, villain. I, I'll argue that because I don't think that's the final. That that's not the final look. They're going to color correct it and make him blue. And he actually that makeup when you see these other images of of him that are online, he looks far more like Apocalypse. So I wouldn't. You know, it's like jumping to conclusions by seeing one photo. Right. Like if he looked like that in the movie finished, then I might have con some concerns. But I don't think that's what you know the final product is going to look like. Well, it could also be you know a case of. Remember when the first Terminator Terminator Genesis photos came out and they were on the cover of Entertainment Weekly right. and it looked like bad cosplay? Yeah. I think it's it's I think it's 
the photographers that they hire to do these jobs in these mainstream magazines where they're photographing costumes just don't have that kind of attention to detail to actually make it look because you know you've been on some big film sets before mm -hmm. I've been on some big film sets it's crazy when you look how cheap everything is like in real life right. like sound and, and tone, room tone, will actually make stuff feel like there'll be a hum in a room mm -hmm. or like something sounds like it's big, but in real life it's just like styrofoam. I remember right. I was on the set, this is years ago, of Army of Darkness, you know, Evil Dead 3, and I just remember how cheap everything looked. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, no. it just looked like the, the headstones on the, in this graveyard were just styrofoam. They were just yeah. styrofoam. But, you know, once it's cut together, once it's lit well, once there's smoke and it's diffused, once you've got sound to Are fill in. Are you talking about movie magic? Movie mm. magic, movie magic. Ugh. Yes. But like, uh, yeah, so that kind of feels, I just, so I'm hoping that it's just another mainstream magazine just doing bad photography. Of, 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 you know, yeah, I there's got to be that attention to deal. Obviously, the directors of photography that Brian Singer are working with, stuff looks great, right? Yeah. And I, th I think, you know, the fan reaction to those pictures from Entertainment Weekly w informed the post house to be like, dial them blue. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just obviously had an effect because even like photos that were released. A, two, a month later that I saw were like, oh, he looks, and you can see the makeup is exactly there, but just because everything's purple, you don't really see it. So I think it, I think we'll all be pleasantly surprised. That's my guess. But well, also uh, it looks different when it moves. I mean, yes, as, totally. you're, as you're well aware, yeah. wardrobe and costume tests in front of camera are important. I'm just excited that my former coworker, Olivia Munn, is in this movie. I'm excited to That's see right. what she, she looks, can do. She's going to be great in Psylocke. I, I think she's. I think she's going to yeah. be great. I, she's. I, I, it's. It's awesome. They just keep releasing uh, Instagram movies of her working out. Like she, I know how to. You know, she kick looks ass. badass. Yeah, she looks like, badass. I think she'll be a standout. I think she will too. Let's yeah. move on to someone who's going to stand out in Wonder Woman, and that's Nicole Kidman. Supposedly, Nicole Kidman is going to be cast as Queen Hoppolita in the upcoming feature film adaptation of Wonder Woman. This cast is getting really big now. I'm excited. Sean Bean, uh, Eva Green, uh, they've both been cast as Ares and as Cersei, and now Nicole Kidman playing the, the Queen, uh, basically uh, Wonder Woman's mom, Prince Diana's mom. So we'll see what happens. What do you, what do you think of this casting? Well, I, I think I, it's all going to come down to Wonder Woman. And the early rumors that I've heard about Batman v Superman is because Wonder Woman's in what? A couple shots in the, in the latest trailer. Yeah. She is the big standout in Batman v Superman. It's going to be unexpected. They're downplaying her role. Right. But my understanding is that she is incredible. So uh, she, it's not like they need to cast up around her. Right. But the fact that they're, they've got this much attention sounds like they're taking it really seriously. I, I really love when they do that, like an established actor that um, is, is not normally in genre stuff. I, I think that's great. Nicole Kidman, I think, is is going to kill it. And it's also like you don't know what they're going to look like in the movie. Nicole Kidman's right. look, I mean, um, although I actually thought she was kind of hot in uh, Batman Forever. I thought she was, <laughs> was kind of hot. As Chase Meridian. Chase Meridian. Um, I hate that I remember yeah. that. Hot entrance. I know. Um, uh, that's yeah. a horrible thing about uh, brains. Brains will remember lots of things like weird, uh, horrible names. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, so yeah. So uh, I, I, I love the fact that, that she's, she's going to have this. Um, it's not, it seems like it's going to be a mentoring role, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so that's awesome. And she's still hot. Yeah. I mean, she's probably going to fight Sean Bean. That's what I hope. They yeah. Have a big showdown at the end. Yeah. So let's move on. We've got some, uh, really fun news in the television world. Preacher, the full trailer finally arrived. We got our first look at Seth Rogen, Evan Green, and Sam Caitlin's production of Preacher on Sunday night. And what a look it was. We got to see Jesse Custer, played by Dominic Cooper, his girlfriend Tulip, played by Ruth Negra, Niga, sorry, and everybody's favorite Irish vampire, Cassidy, played by Joseph Gilgan. Um, Ruth Niga and Joseph Gilgan are also from The Misfits, this amazing series if you haven't checked that out. This looks like it was ripped right out of the pages of Garth Ennis in uh, Steve Dillon's comic book. I loved it. I loved the trailer. I, me and Holly watched it like three times. That you know, Just watching it on YouTube was like, this is fantastic. You know, What did you think about the trailer? I, I I didn't actually watch it. Oh, okay. I feel terrible. I feel terrible now. Well, now you should watch it. Yeah. Now, see, now just hearing you talk about it makes me want to see it. I mean, I, I'm still, I, you know, I don't, I don't have, uh, I don't have stars. I'm really dying to see the right. Ash versus Evil Dead. Oh well, you know, which they, the first can... episode, I guess they released. Yeah. So that's like that's out. like at the top of my list. Um, so, because being at Kamikaze all weekend, I didn't realize that like four days of that event 
really put me behind on my oh, DVR and just everything. No, and I'm just like oh. trolling sites now, like just trying to like get caught up. Like, oh my God, yep. I missed so much. It's so easy to get absorbed into the matrix of real life. There's been yeah. so many huh. new mashup trailers of The Force Awakens. Well, let me just but, tell yeah, you. But tell, tell me about Preacher. Dominic Cooper is, uh, you know, he's playing the the uh, Tony Stark's dad in the Marvel world. And yeah. he also played uh, like, uh, you know, the James Bond's original writer um, in this one series. Uh, he's fantastic. That's all I could say about just him playing Jesse Custer. He's perfect. And I didn't even think about it. I was like, ah, was, you know, we'll see what. And, but seeing this really short, little, quick trailer where it's basically just him talking to this kid, he just captures Jesse Custer. And, and I know they're not doing a straight adaptation of the issues one through 66 of the original Preacher run, but all of the characters that were in Preacher are going to be in this, and I'm pretty sure they're going to tell the story, maybe just from a different, you know, slightly different perspective. Obviously, they're writing it for TV, so it's gonna a lot of things are gonna change. But uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And if you guys haven't checked out Preacher, the comic book, do yourself a favor and get it today. Just go out and buy the very first volume, the trade paperback. You will not be disappointed, especially when the Saint of All Killers shows up. One of the fa my favorite characters of that series, really, literally, like they. They did a great job with that series. So I'm cool. looking forward to seeing this uh, TV show. Let's jump into some movie news. Michael Stuhlberg is cast as Doctor in Doctor Strange. So he's been cast in an upcoming Marvel feature film, playing Nick, Nick, Nicodemus West, a rival doctor who operated on Stephen Strange's hands after his accident, and apparently has been trained by the Ancient One herself, Tilda Swinton. So um, this is a kind of a, re a retelling of the origin that was d done in the comic book series, The Oath, where they introduced this character. Um, what do you think of this character being introduced in the Doctor Strange movie? Obviously, Rachel McAdams is playing Night Nurse, as that's already been released. Like, that's her character. Um, so they're going to be taking some elements from this uh, newer version of Doctor Strange and probably melding it with the older origin. What are your thoughts? My thoughts is... This is going to be one of the most different Marvel movies that we've ever seen. Because what's cool is, is each of the Marvel franchises kind of introduces a whole new element or world and even type of movie, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all superhero movies in a sense, but like this is going to introduce all the mystical world. We had the cosmic universe introduced via Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, this is going to be the most different of all of the Marvel films. And one of the things that I learned when I went to D23, because they had a presentation there that included Doctor Strange stuff, which I thought was great, Benedict, a special message from Benedict Cumberbatch, which right. was cool. Um, they talked about that a lot of the way that the magic is going to be it's not just going to be like smoke and this and lights and bubbles and uh, it's it's the way that they compared it is they talked they talked about it would be somewhat like inception mm -hmm. like a weird dreamlike magical world where it's just completely different than the than the reality that we live in so it's just, so I, I, I'm excited that they're introducing all these elements. Um, I'm curious what cameos that we're gonna get because you know every Marvel filming now we've heard uh, we've heard that Hulk is gonna be a part of Ragnarok. Right. So he's gonna be. So I feel like I don't know. I, see, I, I get a little nervous about that because is that Marvel saying we're not really confident now in these standalone movies that we kind of feel like we need to make all of them Marvel movies or sort of like you know. Uh, little shades of Avengers in there. We've got to throw in other characters because you know Doctor Strange is going to feature some other characters. And if they go by the comic, what ha what's supposed, I mean, what's supposed to happen in the comics I remember reading The Defenders, mm -hmm. which is supposed to be the Netflix series, which includes Doctor Strange, Daredevil, The Hulk. It was all these, I mean, there's so many teams right. in the Marvel Universe, and Defenders was sort of, the Defenders, let's be honest, was sort of the B team. Right. But are they going to bring in, will there be a Daredevil cameo, at least just to, to set the world, or Jessica Jones for sure, right. which is more mystical r r Marvel realm. Well, so yeah. I'm curious if they're going to bring in like cameos from these other characters just to show that like hey this takes place in the Marvel Universe here's some other characters we're going to get to later but they're gonna cross paths in some way or at least let them know geographically speaking they're they're in the same arena I kind of doubt the movie characters will be in the Netflix world but I think the Netflix world as they grow you know like Matt Murdock's gonna be in Jessica Jones maybe Daredevil will show up in Jessica Jones but we definitely know Luke Cage is in Jessica Jones Will they introduce Iron Fist, whoever's going to be playing Iron Fist, in Jessica Jones, or more specifically, the Luke Cage series, which is shooting right now?
now. So probably Iron Fist is going to be in that. It's you know they're not announcing who's playing Iron Fist, but if they're shooting it, you better be sure that Iron Fist is there. The guy who's going to be playing Iron Fist. Well, I mean, in the early Agents of Shield, you know there were there was crossover That's from right. I mean Sif. Yeah, yeah. Chris Evans was in one. Uh, Sam Jackson was in one. Mm-hmm. So they definitely tried to make that connection. I just don't know. I don't. I don't know. I st- I fell off of Agents sure. of Shield this past season. I just. I just. There's too much to watch. Right. There's so much to watch. I couldn't watch a trailer for Preacher. Okay. Right. There's a, there That's is too much. That's how lame I am. There's right a at lot. The of, there's a lot of TV series right now that yeah. are involving Super. It's like it's like literally you have to give up like nine hours of your life every and week. Supergirl. To watch I watched them the all. first episode of Supergirl. I thought it was great. You know, I haven't seen the second episode. I haven't though. seen the second episode either. But I, I don't know if we're gonna talk about it at all. But we could, like, yeah, we'll talk about it. We could. I mean, I I felt there's a little too much story, I, yeah. and it was a little too little too much like. Flash, because I know it's the same producer. Right, Greg Berlanti. It, it felt a little too much like that in the sense of like, you know, with Flash, it was like his origin plus a bunch of meta humans right. that he had to. And in this, it's like Supergirl's origin. Oh, and by the way, this prison prison <laughs> ship filled crashed, with evil, horrible, with super powered villains. Yeah, that we now have to capture. It's like right. felt a little too similar. I felt like let's get to know her right. before we actually set up. Right. Way too. It was way too. Well, I think you for know episode, uh, for the pi- for the pilot, I didn't mind them setting all that up, and that doesn't mean necessarily that every episode is going to have a prisoner of the week that she's going right. to have to hunt down. Hopefully, they just did that so they have that set up as like you know every three or fourth episode there'll be prisoner of the week, like in Smallville, like what will kryptonite be next? Now it is red kryptonite. I turned all rubbery, or <laughs> it's purple kryptonite. I'm invisible. You know, like we're like every every episode was like. Or maybe we- they'll go sing karaoke with their friends at a coffee shop like they do (laughs) on the flash on the flash they always and i get caught up in it it's really dumb because i love the villains i think the flash is one of my Mm. that's my personal favorite uh superhero show Mm -hmm. that's on television at the moment and um I, I am all, so behind on that. I was, oh, yeah, but but I say whenever like like I get caught up in it because like I love all the superhero stuff, right? And I love Cisco's my favorite. I feel like he represents the audience. I love him. But like whenever like I get caught up in the like, well, how come she's not dating him? I, she should totally be into him. What they're doing? So then I get caught up in all like the sort These of soap opera this elements, little soap yeah. opera CW drama sure. stuff, which I really shouldn't care about. And then I get, I get, I get drawn into. So I felt like Supergirl. I expected more of that. I expected right. to like show like why she, why does she have like such low self esteem? She has all these superpowers. Also, why was she wearing glasses? Right, I understand why Superman's wearing glasses because right. Clark Kent wants to hide his identity. But why was she wearing glasses? Because she was she didn't have her secret I know, identity but yet. It was once again she's hiding her superpowers, even though she's not Supergirl yet. She felt like if I wear these glasses, it'll make me blend in more. As like I'm weak. Look, I don't. I'm genetically in de- deficient because I'm wearing these glasses. And John, what do you look like without your glasses? Oh, quite, quite powerful, I must say. Um, so, it's Schnepp from Earth Two. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Let's move on to minor mutations. Uh, this week we got we were talking about the Hulk. Mark Ruffalo is talking more Hulk solo future films. How much he would like to possibly do some if they could figure out the universal angle. Number two, we got Brian Singer talking about X Men Apocalypse. The trailer. When is that dropping? He says pretty soon. We got number three, we got Ryan Reynolds trick-or-treating as Deadpool. That's fantastic footage. Check it out on YouTube. Number four, we've got the Batman feature film. Could it be involving Red Hood and the Death in the Family storylines? Sounds like it might be. And last five, we've got Ant-Man becomes the ninth Marvel film to pass $500 million in the box office. So let's talk about what what strikes you. We were talking about Hulk. Let's start with that. Uh, I, yeah, first of all, um, I guess third time's the charm. Um, if they could make a good Hulk movie. Right. I mean, we had the Ang Lee one, which didn't make any sense right. to me. The absorbing I mean, I just, Man with yeah. the Hulk dogs. What? what? <laughs> oh, God. It was just made by someone who was not a fan of superhero I stuff know. and tried to make it an art film. The, you know, um, the, the Ed Norton one, I don't entirely dislike that one. I mm-hmm. felt like it had potential. Definitely. I, I mean, um, but we haven't really seen, like, I felt like, you know, actually the sequence in... Uh, Avengers 2 Age of Ultron where he Hulk freaks out is sort of the closest we've gotten to a Hulk movie yeah right so I'd love to see a standalone Hulk film you know it's one of those things where it's like I'm glad that they're actually talking about it because I don't think they should ever give up on stuff like that I think Mark Ruffalo is the best Bruce Banner yeah um and and that sort of just makes me believe that maybe one day if they think they can make a new Hulk film 
maybe they'll make a Fantastic Four movie. You know what That's I mean? Good. Like that works. fourth times yeah. the charm. Fourth times the charm right. for Fantastic Four. Let's see a good Fantastic Four movie. Let's see a really good Hulk film. I, I'm I'm always optimistic about these things, you know, and until they come out and prove right. me wrong, prove and disappoint me. But um, but yeah, I, I th that one I would love to see that. And, I, and Ruffalo also, like, I don't think he gets enough screen time in the Avengers. Well, you know what's you know? interesting about Ruffalo is like. I mean, before Avengers came out, there was no talk about a Hulk movie or a Hulk anything. Really, Guillermo del Toro is the only guy who was like, I'm developing this Hulk TV series, and all of the Hulks are going to be in there. Remember? And he was right. like, yeah, but I that, remember that. But Guillermo's always got like 48 projects that are going right. on at the same time, and you're like, just do one of them, dude, because they all sound amazing. So it's like, but he gets caught in that development hell where it's like, you know, when you're spinning so many plates, a lot of them just fall and break. So mm -hmm. it's like, that's one of the ones that just didn't move forward. But the why it didn't, though, is... Everyone freaked out over Mark Ruffalo's performance as the Hulk and the new version of right. this Hulk in in the Avengers. Him smashing Loki, him punching Thor. Just the idea of that we have a Hulk, you know, I've got an army, we have a Hulk. Just the way the Hulk worked in the Avengers, just it made me so happy as a nerd who grew up like loving those Stanley Jack Kirby ones with when the Hulk was only in it for like two episodes. I right, think it was right, in two right. issues. He's like, remember he's dressed up just like juggling elephants and he was like, I had this stupid circus clown makeup on. So it's like those kinds of things. Like he's like not a good team player. And it, I'm glad that they've developed it to the point where he left in Avengers Age of Ultron. He's mm -hmm. out. So it's sort of like, where is he? We don't know. But he's saying the Hulk. Well, if, we know where he is in right. Asgard. That's right. Well, he's definitely in Asgard or they're saying not Asgard. What they're saying, he's not on Earth and he's not on Asgard. He's on some other planet. Planet Hulk. Who knows? Uh, so, because everyone yeah. was theorizing that this was set up for the Hulk to be in Guardians too, but right. my understanding is he's not. Right. He's definitely not in Guardians. Well, too. no, he's. See, the thing is that what they were they were kind of hinting is because Universal has the distribution rights. There's it gets it a little sticky for Disney to right do, now to do like a standalone. Yeah, Hulk film. but right. he's they own the rights to the Hulk. They just can't do do that full clean distribution. So, but they can, he can be in anybody's movie. So that's what like I don't think the Hulk's going to show up in Doctor Strange. I think he like. Bruce Banner is going to have a cameo in Civil War, not the Hulk, but Bruce Banner. I think the Hulk is definitely obviously going to be in Thor Ragnarok, or as I like to call it, Pla Thor Planet Hulk now, because it's like, <laughs> we'll see what happens with that. But you know what? I mean, who's going to show up in Doctor Strange? We were talking about that earlier. Remember when, when Ant-Man goes into the other dimension, you know? This right. Is, all right, spoilers, guys. Anyone who's watching this, I, I know I, I usually sometimes talk and don't give the spoiler warning, but this wave of the hand means that when I wave my hand, I've stopped talking about spoilers. So you might want to mute it if you care about spoilers because I'm going to talk about them. So turn off your volume. All right, so in Ant-Man, we've seen Ant-Man, when he shrinks and he's going through those weird, crazy, like Doctor Strangey type of microverse dimensions, mm -hmm. a lot of people say they saw like an image of the wasp, the original wasp from the original Hank, P Hank Pym's wasp. Whoa. Yeah. Well, you know they're making that sequel with Ant-Man and the Wasp, so right. maybe part of that will involve get bringing her back with Could, some reunion. Or does Doctor, is Doctor Strange involved in bringing her back? Could that be a post credit scene where it's like, I found her, you know, wow. she's like all freaking out and brings... Wow, I, I mean, love this. Yeah, it's very possible. So let's let's talk a little bit about Ryan Reynolds trick-or-treating oh as Deadpool. That's fantastic. So cool, but the the one thing is that, you know, from what we've seen with uh, the the you know of Deadpool so far that tr that amazing weird mm -hmm. trailer i think that Deadpool i mean dead it's true in the comics that Deadpool is not as much it, it's as much about Deadpool as it is about making fun of comics yes and i do believe that what's going to happen with this with this film is this film is going to be making fun of superhero movies that's what the Deadpool movie is. I so is. hope so. I so hope so too. It's gonna it's it's gonna basically be like a feature length version of an honest trailers where they just make wow. fun of everything. This is my this is my theory based on what we've seen so far. I mean, and it's going to be in the midst of that still a really good superhero film. So in a way, it's kind of like an Edgar Wright, I think, is great at that. Right. Where he did a zombie movie that mocked and made fun of zombie movies. Followed the rule of rules of zombie movies and ended up being a really good zombie movie. Yeah, you know, Shaun of the Dead. So I feel like uh, Deadpool is going to be the same thing, where it's it's just going to be mocking and making fun of superhero movies. I I want Deadpool to have an element of Ferris Bueller's Day Off in there, where he like talks to the camera because they're constantly saying he's going to be breaking the fourth wall. Good. We haven't seen anything in the trailer of him breaking the fourth wall yet. So I'm just curious what license he has. 
that the character has at least um, to talk about other movies. I mean, well, obviously from could, the trailer, he, he could, can rip on Green Lantern. He could crap on Fantastic Fantastic Four, which would be kind yep. of funny. He could talk about X Men. I mean, can he talk about the Avengers? Like, why not? What, like, I mean, that's the thing that always confuses me with some of these because I feel like with some of these, with like Spider Man, obviously is right. now officially part of the Marvel Universe right. in this deal. And while Fox doesn't necessarily have Fox doesn't have a deal with Marvel, are they going to reference? They're gonna say names. I mean, even in Net, in the Netflix Daredevil right. series, there's like newspaper clippings on the wall. That because, but that's because they have a deal. Like they're right, like right. that's that's, that's Marvel all Studios Marvel deal. Studios. Yeah. Fox is different, so it's like I think though that they could get away with it within the realm of comedy slash parody laws right. because. I don't know how funny because they might not even it. say the name Thor, but yeah. there's some idiot with a hammer and a green yes. guy, you know, like not necessarily directly invoke their name. Exactly like the trailer, right? So the trailer is like, just don't put me in a green outfit. You right, know, it's like that's right. animated, where he's basically ripping on Green Lantern yeah, or the yeah. CG outfit. So and I, 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 what's cool is is Ryan Reynolds, who who I've always liked. Uh, I, I, it looks like he's having fun. It yes. looks like he's having fun. And, and if he's, he's having it. fun, it's going to be good. And trick-or-treating, too. I mean, that's as cool as, like, when uh, Chris Evans um, was going to, you know, children's hospitals, you know, dressed as <laughs> Captain America. <laughs> right. Same thing with Chris Pratt as Star-Lord. Totally. I really like when, you know, and, I, and, and I'm sure this is true with the casting. They're casting people not only that fit the character can do the acting job, but pe actors that have character. Actors that, you know, off-camera are... Uh, essentially good people and care about fans and care about fandom right on i i agree i think with one of the other things that came out whether or not it's a hundred percent it's it's one of these things that everyone is covering like the batman is supposedly going to be about the red hood and death in the family it's like well who said this officially no one no one so it's not really official. the source is nothing no the source is rumored but that's where we are with the internet nowadays, Chris. Isn't it fun? No official anything. It's sort of like, what did I? What did the box of like cereal lot, tell you? I feel like a lot of that stuff is just fan wish fulfillment. Mm -hmm. You know, like, look, there are a lot of things that I would love to see in genre stuff and love to see on the big screen. But you know, that's just me projecting. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be. I mean, that is a really dramatic story. I and don't know people how have just said from. I heard this from the inside. So it's kind of these like side rumor weird things. Yes, but who? No one's officially. You know what that is? So. That's just as bad as one of those lame articles which we all see on Facebook. It's clickbait mm -hmm. it's that clickbait. said this fan theory about X is actually kind of brilliant. And every time I've clicked on one of those, it's never brilliant. No. It's never brilliant. No. It's always some dumb thing that's like incredibly long with this fan theory about Jar Jar will blow your mind. Nope, because you prefaced it by saying it was a fan theory. That's right. Awful. Fan theories. So Sorry. Let's go with speculation, though. If the mm -hmm. Batman does cover the Red Hood origin as well as covers the death in the family, what do you think? How do you think? Well, no, play no, wait, now. We say Red Hood. I mean, mm -hmm. we know old school right. that the Red Hood was the Joker. Right. If you go to the killing, I mean, I'd love to just see the killing joke yes. woven into the Batman uh, big screen. You know, I agree that, 100%. That's, that story, the killing joke, I mean, by Alan Moore is one of the best. And Brian Boland. Oh, my God. That Incredible comic art. book will just blow your mind. You really see it from the perspective of the Joker, not in some lame way like, we're going to show it from the villain's point of right. view. He was a patsy. Mm -hmm. He was he, he was, was set the, up. He was set up, and he was a victim. And, and it just drove him you understand the motivation right you know whereas like when you look at like if we were talking the star wars prequels one of my favorite questions to ask people is why did darth vader why did anakin skywalker turn to the dark side and kill children and there's really not a really strong answer right when you read the killing joke you understand what drove you know the you know, joker mad the strong answer is obi-wan fa failed I mean, there, right, there's no right. there's no answer for Anakin. It's just like because there's not there's not even a built in motivation right, right there. Right. But the the thing for Obi Wan is like, how did I ever see any like this guy's so purely I, evil? Look, I I love those flipping stories. Right. Like I love like it's part of why I played the Tie Fighter series. Anyone remember the Lucas Holland games? Uh, these you know the X Wing and Tie Fighter. Tie Fighter was basically telling the entire story of the original Star Wars trilogy from the Empire's point of view. Oh, nice. And it was awesome. You can see the you can see the animated cutscenes actually on YouTube places. Uh, check it out, which is which is they're they're awesome. So uh, but yeah, I I I I'd love to see them bring stuff like that. But like this Red Hood, of course, is different. Right. They're referencing the the updated Red Hood, which is basically 
what it's uh it's jason todd right yeah well i mean it's like they're what they're talking about in these these rumors is obviously dick grayson's going to be involved right. jason todd is going to be involved i would love what you're saying to be true i mean they're they're making the killing joke as an animated film right now right which which i guess mark they hamill said, and kevin conroy are coming on as the, the voices of batman those and are the, the only two guys that should be doing yeah those voices i think so ever. too i think they're both fantastic um, what's going to happen with uh, the Batman and uh, Ben Affleck? I don't know. Supposedly he's going to be directing it. I just hope they, uh, at some point before the end of this year, announce when these movies are actually coming out. Because, you know, they haven't announced when the Batman is happening yet. And that just is, as you being an ultimate Batman oh, God, fan, I mean, come it's on. Huge. It's I think it's so, such so great that they cast him. And we haven't even seen Batman v Superman. But just from that trailer alone, I'm sold as oh, I'm, him as I'm, Bruce I'm Wayne and Batman. But I'd like to see a grittier... First of all, I'd like to see an R-rated Batman movie. That's never going to happen. And it, well, <laughs> I mean, I would love to see... But like, I'd also like to see one that doesn't rely so much on digital effects. One of the great things that Chris Nolan did in the, the Dark Knight trilogy, mm-hmm. the, in the Nolanverse version of Batman, right. is that... He never used digital effects unless it was absolutely necessary. And most of, uh, most of the digital effects, actually, if you watch the behind the scenes for the Nolan Batman films, is removal of things. Right. Um, in, or, because he used mostly practical effects. I love what I've seen of Batman v Superman. For my taste, it's still a little too digital. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, how do you do Superman and how do you do some of those big fights? I mean, obviously you're going to need to use digital effects, but I'd like to see a Batman movie that doesn't rely so heavily on digital effects, that's more of a crime film, that's a mystery, that is, I, I still think the best Batman movie ever made is The Dark Knight with Heath, Heath Ledger as the Joker. Let's see something like that. Let's see something that is a little bit more raw, a little bit more you know, old school, and and not dependent on all this extended universe I, stuff. But I think you will see that because I don't think Ben Affleck, if you've seen his, all of his other films, they aren't relying on CG. No, look at and he's exactly. a really great director. So I think with him directing the Batman and having his writer, Chris Terrio, coming on and writing a script with him, as well as, uh, who's the other guy who's writing a script with him? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff Johns. Jeff Johns. Yeah, Jeff yeah, Johns. Who's a, right. who's a you know editor in chief of Marvels, got a great run with the Green Lantern, knows how to write comic books. Bringing that in, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So no, I, I have I have faith in Ben Affleck, and I feel that just him being cast in Batman v Superman gave me faith because here's a guy that should have, by all accounts, won the Oscar for Best Director, got boned on right. on the nomination, right. made what I thought was one of the best movies of that year. Go and watch Argo. And and get a taste of what the Batman uh, standalone film by Affleck could be. I, right. I feel like he's he's become like a guy who's really entrenched in like the indie world, and also has worked with Grant Hesloff, who who produced uh, Argo. Who I mean, I knew I knew Grant back in the old school days in the '90s when he was doing like you know little films. He made this little movie that he actually is in called Bug, which I'm not sure if sure. Bug is out. Zod is in that too, isn't he? It, yeah, that's right. That's right. that's right. Yeah. Michael Shannon. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is a different movie called Bug. Oh, for real? It's okay. a different movie called Bug that's a comedy that's like basically an ensemble piece about everything happening where these people just sort of have these lives that just interconnect. How many movies are day. there that are called Bug? There's a lot of I movies called Bug. I didn't realize there was even two. There's a lot. Yeah, but this movie, I just, I know because Grant came to a film festival that I programmed and Bug played that film festival. I'm not even sure if it's streaming Let me or bring it back out. to some sweatiness. Argo was also based on Kirby's Lords of oh, Light, remember? What's I up, son? That. I love that. Yeah, just all the nerd stuff that was in it. That that <laughs> final end shot where Ben Affleck is with his son, and they just show like over the credits the 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 shelf of toys. Mm-hmm. I was freaking out. Like it's mm-hmm. just like the the guy knows his stuff. He's I feel like in a sense that Ben Affleck is like one of us. He's not filled like with all that. He really cares. One I just finished us. watching Project one Greenlight. Of us. One, one of us. Hey, so let's talk about the next segment today. It's flashback. And this week we are flashing back to one of your favorite films, Chris. It's oh. Fantastic Four 2, Rise of the Silver Surfer. Came out in 2007. Here we have the second official film adaptation of Marvel's Fantastic Four with Mike Chiklis. Michael Chiklis is the thing. Jessica Alba is the invisible woman. Ian Griffod as Mr. Fantastic. Chris Evans, obviously, the the one is known as Captain America now, was the Human Torch. And Julian McMahon came uh, returning as Doctor Doom. We got this, uh, the great Doug Jones as the body of Silver Surfer and Lawrence Fishburne as the voice of the Silver Surfer. 
We had the director, Tim Story, returning a second time. He did the first movie, came back to do the second one. And he takes the Fantastic Four through another comedic adventure to fight the planet-eating cloud called Galactus. That's right. I said Galactus was a cloud. Let's talk. That's, that's, let's, let's, let's just talk about that. That for was a minute. the first mistake. Yeah. Look, there's one good thing about this movie because everything else is awful. Mm -hmm. The writing, the I mean, there the, a lot of the writing is writing around the fact that they didn't have any money to make a real telling of the first Galactus sto story, which is what issues 49, 50, and 51 of Fantastic uh, it's Four. 48, 48, 48, 48 and 49, 49, and 50. Yeah. When I read those as a kid, I thought I will never see a movie that is as epic as this three issue story arc with the Silver Surfer introducing right. Galactus, the ultimate nullifier, the Watcher coming into it. The like, I mean, it was, it was basically the Death Star. I mean, Galactus right. was the personification of the Death Star. And I know Marvel Comics was a huge influence for George Lucas in the writing of, of the, the Star Wars films initially. So I, I, just, I, I, I just, I get chills just thinking about it because I have it in reprint form. Mm -hmm. I read it in giant size form as oh, a yeah. kid. Love that. And the fact that they couldn't even use some of the best elements of it, the fact that they couldn't do the somehow ultimate, wrangle the rights to get Do the Galactus, ultimate nullifier towards the camera. The ultimate nullifier, which That's basically, right. it looked like it looked like a weird, like... Yeah, it's like a lighter, like a lighter or something. It looked like a lighter. It's like, it was weird. Like with Thanks, a Human Torch. Zoink. Yeah, and it's like this sort of like little yeah. nondescript. <laughs> like, yeah, so so Galactus like no. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god. But uh, but yeah, they just it just it's weak. And and uh, the 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 guy who plays Doctor Doom is just never good. He just did never had the gravitas. The only good thing about this movie is Doug Jones. Mm -hmm. Doug Jones, which they voiced a, him over. Unfortunately, I thought that was a crime. That was fine. I didn't mind that because what he was able to do with his body. Doug Jones is a modern Lon Chaney. Yeah, I mean, he is this guy that his his instrument as an actor is his entire body. I mean, when you've seen him in Guillermo del Toro films, you'll never. You always got to look up who he is, and he's often multiple characters. Right. Um, or in the Hellboy series, I mean, he's just like. I, I, I love Doug and he was he 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 made the Silver Surfer. Yeah. Everything else about this movie just told me they didn't have money. It just it was depressing. Really? So, I mean, yeah, it just it just was like I we think can't money is do the, it epic. Money is the least issue for this horrible series of two Ugh. films. Based on one of my childhood, my favorite comics. One of my favorite, that, comics. Favorite, comics, my favorite like comics when I was... 49? Okay, did well, that not, blow you away as not, a kid? Not just those issues, all of the first run of the first like 70 issues The of first Fantastic 100 Four. issues I read of the Fantastic uh, You know, Four. the last 30 aren't as... Because they kept recycling characters. Yeah. But those first like 60 to 70 issues were just like new idea after new after. Uh, it was just incredible. That's where Black Panther came from. That's where the Inhumans came from. That's where Silver Surfer and, and Galactus and all these characters. That's where Doctor Doom came from. That's where so many of the greatest villains of Marvel's entire history, you know, some weren't the greatest ones. They had the, you know, the invisible, the red ape, or what was that one guy? He was Russian. And he had the oh, three weird, the three weird apes. Yeah, they, and he had I can't the apes remember what it, go to yeah. the cosmic race. Or the so Impossible they had, like, Man. Powers. Yeah, there's some weirdo ones. But when I saw I liked this, Impossible Man. No, I mean, but it's like he kept showing up. Like I was like, yeah, he became like, but oh, he's scrolls, like Plick. Yeah, scrolls. Scrolls were fantastic. The Kree. All yeah. these characters were all introduced. I mean, the Adam Marvel, Warlock. Marvel you know? is like, you know, it combined the cosmic world. It was scientifically Psycho based. Man, the microverse, all they, that stuff. The microverse, it had the negative zone. The negative zone, Annihilus. Annihilus, oh my God. Like, like, the Fantastic Four was just a bevy of creativity. Right. And, and untapped. Really was, still untapped. Still untapped. Yeah, it's never been translated to the screen correctly. Right. So every time I see anything Fantastic Four related... I, I always just get sad of like, this will never be as good as the, these comics. Whereas like, you know, I, I have felt at times with the Dark Knight series that like, oh my God, this has reached the level. Cause I was never a big fan of the Tim right. Burton. I'm sorry to say I was never big. This might be sacrilege to some of you. I was never a big fan of the Tim Burton uh, Batman movies. You just felt I'm they were sorry. too jokey. Too jokey. It, it, it made fun of, you know, Batman wasn't even the focus. He looked like he was sort of a dork. He was not like... You know, he was not, look, he's not Clark Kent. He's not a nerd, you know? He's a, he's a playboy. He's more like James Bond than Clark Kent. So, uh, but, but seeing the, 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 you know, Batman Begins and The Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises has, is, has problems. It's kind of poopy. 
Right. We can talk about that for a whole episode. <laughs> know, right? But it but like it captured like, oh my God, this is this was like reading Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. Yeah, especially this is like, Batman. This is like Batman in the Dark Year Night. One. This yeah. is like some of the great Batman comics, the, the Neil Adams stuff, like some of the great Batman comics that I've read. Like it, it captured the tone of that. And nowhere has any of the Fantastic Four movies captured the tone. The closest one is the Roger Corman one, which you could probably see on YouTube, the whole thing. The whole thing is on YouTube. The whole thing is on YouTube. And I actually happen to be in the documentary, throw out a plug. Uh, for this movie called Doomed, the untold story of Roger Corman's Fantastic Four. I was on the set for the full two weeks of the filming of that movie, and because uh, they shot it like they had to start <laughs> shooting before the holidays. Right. And and I was on the set because I was such a huge Fantastic Four fan. I just remember that sinking feeling when I was there, going like, "Oh my God, they're just not." They don't this have. Be you awful. talk about a movie that this has no like money. This was like in the early '90s, but yeah. like, man, did it was it was just it was weird. I was a kid. I had first moved to LA, and I just like got lucky enough to know someone at Roger Corman who let me go on the set of the Fantastic Four. I was in heaven until I started to see how cheap everything looked. Yeah, and then. There you go. But yeah, but like Fantastic Four is a special place in my heart just because that that was my gateway comic. It was the first time I started reading comics. I, did, I started reading them, you know, they were like in the hundreds issues and then I had to like go back sure. and read everything in reprint form. You know, I got the son of Marvel Comics, Origins of Marvel but Comics, I those hardcovers. I love those. Uh, I, loved, I just got uh, the soft The Marvel ones. Treasury Editions. Sure. Remember those? You kind of had to patch together. This is before digital. You had to kind of patch together like, well, I've read this one, but right. I haven't read it, uh, issue eight. Well, you know, I'm going to find issue eight or I'll borrow one from a friend or maybe there'll be a comics dealer that will let me take I started it out of reading, the plastic I started reading bag fantastic. so I can actually read the comic so I can like have read the full Wait run. a sec, Chris. That's you, how nerdy I am. You have to stop talking for five seconds. Okay. Um, I remember reading Fantastic Four uh, Marvel's greatest comics. They were just reprints of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's comics. Do you wow. remember those reprints? Yes, I do. So that's how the I, only way we could afford to see them. That's how we we got introduced to those kinds of comics back in the like the late seventies because they didn't have like digital versions of comics now where you can just like have every comic available to you. There was no way to get to. They didn't even have a lot of comic book stores. You would have to go to like a paperback trader where there's just like this weird bin of like used comics that were like you can have whatever's in the bin for five dollars. You know right, that's right. kind of like. At least when I was a kid, introduced to the world of comics, you either had the little swinger rack, you know, the the just right, the metal right, rack. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, they were all bindled up, and you know, nothing was perfect or in mint condition. It was all like fumbled through. I didn't and care. Stuff. I just wanted to read. No, them. I know. I, I just it always it the didn't only matter. Thing that me out was was when anything said still only. Ah, that's when it right. said still only thirty five cents. cents. I'm like, it's going up. What is it going to be? Forty cents, and then it would go up to forty cents, which lasted maybe a few months, and then it went up to like it just kept going up. That's right. Forty five. Remember oh they were like God. twelve uh, comics. I think when I first yeah. noticed them, were like twelve cents. All right. Before so, that, they were ten cents. Yeah, it was like for me fifteen five cents. Five cents. Fifteen cents, twenty for a microsecond, then twenty five. Twenty five. Yeah, they would just like and they, they stayed at twenty five for a while. For, they stayed at twenty five uh, for a long time. I yeah. do remember that. And then they just sort of jumped to thirty five. Oh, or 30 so cents. quick! It was thirty and then thirty five, and they yeah, had like, that like, like that. it was like a sticker that they put on still only, uh, and they're like keep replacing that. the sticker. Fifty cents, sixty ah. cents, seventy five. But what's cool yeah. about that era is a lot of those comics you can get cheap. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were just at Stanley's Kamikaze, and there'll be these bins. And I always look for them. They'll yep. be like, everything in here is just a dollar. Doesn't matter, like what year, what whatever. They don't care. They're a dollar. And I love that. I love seeing and that. And it's really like, great to just kind of thumb through a bunch. Like I just randomly asked a guy. I was like, you know, I saw like a, a Phil Lamar hates Rom. So, sorry, guys. But uh, Phil Lamar hates Rom? He hates why? Rom. So I know. I was like, hey, why do you hate Rom so much? And he was like, I just thought it was a waste of time. But I was like. Well, Rom Space Night, which is based on a toy, right? Right. Well, it's based on a toy. But what they did is like, when I was, I was talking to Grant Morrison. I heard Morrison, they made it cool. Well, the, like I, James Gunn's a big fan of it. I was talking to Grant Morrison about it this weekend at Kamikaze. And while I was talking to him about it, like I was saying, I bought these issues so that I can make Phil Lamar sign them for me. <laughs> But I couldn't. I didn't get to make it over to the South Hall. Uh, Kamikaze was so giant that I was in the West Hall, and I never got a, to get over to the South Hall. But don't you know Hall. Phil? Like I do. Yeah. So you could probably. Oh, I'm gonna go to his house. No, I don't, I don't know. It's him more like fun that, to but, do it in public. Yeah, I wanted to publicly <laughs> be like, I brought the ROMs, and be like, oh. So anyway, if you know, if you want Phil Lamar, bring some ROM comics the next time he's doing a signing because he loves ROM. He doesn't like ROM. But, but not, but not every comic that was based on a toy was absolutely terrible. I remember really loving up, the Micronauts. We brought up Silver Surfer. Okay. Okay. 
Rom is technically just Silver Surfer. It's like this guy, really? just like Norrin Rad, had to give up his life, become, instead of getting encased in silver like the Silver Surfer, he became Rom and fought the Wraiths instead of like giving up his life and Galactus not eating his planet. And he's, it's kind of like it's a really weird parallel to the exact origin of the Silver Surfer. And you could very easily see why people like James Gunn or a lot of other people would be like, look, Rom is like a perfect, really cool kind of, you know, superhero slash Star Warsian character that can be adapted into something really cool. But you're gonna say the Micronauts, go rock on, man. Yeah, no, no, just like there are some comics based on toy franchises where they're like, it was sort of an, it was just sort of this like thing to basically advertise the toy. And I love the Micronauts because you could just like take them apart and you could, we're gonna change the colors of the time traveler, a <laughs> Croyer Baron Karza, which was basically a cheap Darth Vader ripoff. Right. But it was metal, they were heavy. I mean, they had, you could make like, them a centaur. Yeah, I mean, you could practically, I mean, they, they were they were really cool toys at the time. So I don't know, man, like that, like I, 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 that comic just, I always yeah. loved. I love that idea of like sort of the microverse and, and what was, so, so that was my thing. So I can see, like, I understand why some people have an affection for Rom. Yeah. And Micronauts actually was drawn by Michael Golden. Like yeah. those first like 12 issues are fantastic. And they're such a fun story. If you've never checked out Micronauts, you should. In fact, a little bird told me they're working on a new series of the Micronauts. We'll be seeing that soon. Nice. Hopefully it works out. So yeah, Fantastic Four for me. Let's get back to talking about this film for okay, like 45 okay. seconds. Uh, fantastic Four, The Rise of the Silver Surfer. So disappointing for me on so many levels. So disappointing Let's, for you as well. Like, you oh, I hated experience? it. Okay, I good. absolutely hated it. I didn't go see it in the theater. I just couldn't. I just couldn't go see it in wow. the theater because I hated the first one so much. I didn't see that one in the theater. I just saw trailers for it, and I just didn't like it. And when the reviews came out, I was like, I can't see it. I eventually saw it when it came out on video and just was just didn't like the the comedic tone. They missed the mark. They missed the whole idea of like, well, they're supposed to be a family that makes fun of each other, and the Human Torch and the thing are always arguing. They took that in such a juvenile way that like the the adaptation was like a bad sitcom. And so that once they introduced this bad sitcom element to the movie, the the characters themselves, like the villain, could never really be villainous. Like I thought, your uh, Doctor Strange in the first one having electrical powers, and you know th they keep making that mistake of like bringing the villain in and having to have his origin tied in to the. Super it doesn't need to be. You tied don't in. have you know to tie you it do? in. You know what you could do. Just do what they did in the Dark Knight. He's it's just the Joker, right? And he's just evil, and he's just awful, and show what he does. Like they could have just said. Doctor Doom exists. Yep. Like, and, and that last Fantastic Four movie, I just, I, I don't want to get in a long discussion about that. It went the opposite direction of having the tone be way dark right. and brooding and just kind of slow. And that's, I'm sure you guys have already talked about it on the show, so I don't want to take up a lot of time with it. What I do want to say is there's never been a good Fantastic Four movie. It's a really a matter of, and this is what I loved about the comic was it mixed everything so well. Yes, it was a family drama. Right. These people, at the end of the day, they cared about each other. As much as like Thing, and they had that sort of brotherly rivalry right. thing in Human Torch, they cared about each other. Like there were high stakes of people dying. And like Reed Richards was like the somber voice of like, this could destroy not just our world, but the entire universe. You know, when like certain things like that would be like a dun dun dun, like, like, oh my God. And then like, like, you know, him having to go against Dr. Doom. I remember what was the one issue where they have to just, do they connect their brains and they're just sort of fighting with their brains. Remember that one? You remember the visual of that? Kirby drew it, like where they're just sitting there and they've got these things and their brains are connected with these devices. No, I don't. It's a, it's a famous FF, I mean, I mean image. I know you've seen it, but um, yeah, like, like just, that it, there's never been anything that's captured that tone. I really hope that Peyton Reed, who's directing, well, he was gonna do a '60s that's what version I'm of. He's directing Ant-Man, yeah. the sequel to Ant-Man. He was he pitched because I had a long conversation at Comic, long conversation with him at Comic Con in the '90s. Mm. Was the '90s or early 2000s? It might have been early 2000s. It was early 2000s. It was early 2000s. So Peyton Reed was there, and I was like, "Hey, dude. Hey, well, you're. I didn't realize you. Because sometimes you see people that are there. You're like, don't expect to be there. Like, oh, you're a nerd, eh? Right. And and I got in this long conversation with him. He told me his whole pitch for Fantastic Four, which was a period movie that was set in the '60s. It right. was sort of supposed to be that Camelot era JFK with them wearing just like they did in the in the first, you know. Jumpsuits, basically, old. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And just like, it was not a superhero movie. It was a period film. These scientists that got, you know, imbued with these powers. We've never seen that. Never, I feel like Tone, as you know, like having directed a number of projects and done things, 
tone is the biggest thing that a director does is is sort of this herald for keeping the tone right. You got to right. make compromises here on budget, okay, but it's all about the tone. That's what the director is right. really responsible for more than anything. And the tone includes every element from casting to right. story to sound design to music to just the way everything's edited together. The way, the way everything's the edited flow. together. Like tone is a big we've never seen a Fantastic Four no. movie. And but and that tone is in my brain when I read the comics. I've never seen it. No. And I want to see it someday. I would love to see that too. I think uh we both as uh Stanley Jack Kirby fans, uh someday we will get that Fantastic Four movie. Well, yeah, there's I mean there've been there was a rumor which is not did not prove out to be true that you know Fox wanting to do the X-Men TV series right. was going to trade the rights to Fantastic Four. There's been no official announcement, but I got to think that some deal like that is still at least in the thinking because what is Fox has to make a decision about Fantastic Four. Right. There will, there's, a, there's a deadline for that date. They have to make a decision or it Get goes back. Get in production back. or it goes back. Right. Uh, yeah, so, so they got to figure it out. Yeah. I would like to see them figure it out sooner than later. Yes. Let's, let's, talk, about, let's talk about a weird comic book character that I think would work pretty well in a TV series or movie. This week's Spotlight is on the creeper let's uh <laughs> see what the creeper looks like guys that is the steve ditko freaky looking creeper character the creeper is a frightening anti-joker anti-hero who looks like a clown mixed with an edm kid squeezed through a meat grinder filled with hallucinogenic mushrooms and then recongealed into a pasty yellow thing with red fur and teeth jack Ryder is the creeper's origin having always been let like t this character jack Ryder has been tied to uh dr yats he had a strange serum, he was injected, became a dual personality, and then later in the early 2000s, the, the whole thing, instead of like a weird serum, it was like a nanocell smart skin that involved the same character, Dr. Yatz, who was working with the Joker to create the Joker toxin. So they kind of ended up, even though he's like kind of Jokerish and was like, wasn't involved with the Joker originally, then later, years later, like a couple of years ago, um, basically they tied the Joker back into him. But what do you think about the Creeper? Have you ever checked him out, any individual stories? of the creeper I, I've never stuff. checked out any individual stories of the creeper but I got to think like one of the one of the things I know has an effect when uh, illustrators are designing comics and colorists colors that you've never never seen in combination before right. is yeah. a big part of a character Definitely. design because it would look, you know, obviously he couldn't have Superman colors. Right. You have to pay attention to that. So I feel like it's like, we've never seen this color combination before. Right. But the cool thing about the Creeper is I was at Dragon Con a couple of years ago and I saw someone in a full accurate Creeper costume. And in real life, it looked awesome. I mean, it was badass. So I, I, I am a big fan of taking like sort of these unknown characters that don't have that kind of mythology that everyone knows right. where you can kind of translate them to the screen and not just use the main elements of their origin, but you can actually add kind of other deeper layers to it yeah, to, see, totally. to see what happens with it. So, so yeah, I, I'm excited about anything, especially connected to the Joker. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, with this newer origin, I think, I mean, you don't need him to be tied into anyone, especially using nanotechnology. It's like, that's kind of a perfect, almost like the Flash, like a bunch right. of weird serum. These things came together that created the super speed. It's, it's really literally the way, like, I was out in outer space and beamed with Gamma Rays, or there's no real reason to have it make sense like i got bit by a radioactive spider now i'm spider-man it's kind of these kinds of origins the more they try to take them seriously and like you know that's sometimes the fault of a superhero film when they do this entire extended Ex origin you know that's what i thought not to get back to fantastic four but i will just to make one quick point mm -hmm. i don't think they needed the recent fantastic four movie to tell an origin correct it doesn't matter it doesn't as matter. a matter of fact for the first almost 50 issues Every other issue, I know for the first 10 issues, they almost did it every time. They retold the origin, because they were always getting a new audience yep. with Fantastic Four every issue. Mm -hmm. They were trying to establish the Marvel Universe. Every issue retold the origin in flashback. Right. What they could have done is just, they are the Fantastic Four. They are doing, totally. you know, they, they have these powers, they're revered in the world, some threat, you know, they're, they're winners, here comes a threat, and they, they, for the first time they're actually defeated. You know what? And they, some, they could just somehow show a five minute flashback. Mm -hmm. It does look ex actually in uh, Batman v Superman, we're gonna get, bat, you know, Batman's origin retold yet again, we don't need it. He's just Batman, I don't think we need it. 
Uh, I think it'll be done in a flashback, though. Like no, what it you're is going to be done about, in a flashback you know? from what it looks yeah. like. But like, I, I feel like that's it, that's fine. That's the best way to do it. Just just feature the elements. Get to the good part. You right. know, I mean, George Lucas famously just said, "I'm just starting in the middle. I'm not going to tell you sure. the origins of all this stuff." And what's cool is you can catch up later. I mean, TV shows that have these long mythological arcs like right. do that all the time. You know, I think the Flash has done that so well, where they've seeded things in there that pay off later. I think it, I think it's just one of the best written shows on TV, The Flash. I'm sure some people in the in the comments will disagree with me, mm-hmm. but you know what? There's a lot of good things uh, th- th- that are on. Here's so something you, you no mentioned. No disrespect to the other stuff. Fantastic Four, a great movie version of that would be, it just starts off with like the Mole Man or a Nihilus. They're just in the middle of an adventure. Yeah. And you literally see like five minutes of them doing something fantastic. They come back to Earth and while they're coming back to Earth, you cut to the credit sequence and you have just like how the Incredible Hulk did the, incre- the, the 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 origin sequence? You do the origin sequence that way because you don't do it over need the it credits. over the credits. At the end, you just I would no, not in the, I'm saying in the title sequence. Right. You just rock it through and you get that whole thing. Two minutes tops. Bam. Now you're into the next adventure. Maybe well, Galactus they do that shows on the Flash up or whatnot. Every week, every week, you know the the title sequence. He tells his tells quick origin and sort yep. of it's a cool setup. Like like I feel like they could do that with the Fantastic Four. I think I think in a title sequence might sound a little might feel a little TV ish, but in a Flash. Back. Well, they did it in The Amazing Spider-Man 2 with Alex Ross art. Remember that? I mean, they right, just, right. I think there's great ways to do it where so that was like kind of the motto of, of Stan Lee for like the first, like, I think 15 years of Marvel. Every comic book, you had to retell the, the origin in every comic because he said there's always a new reader. That Exactly. So but, it was but in I, every I, issue. But I think that worked. It was cool. I think it was and what fine. was cool was sometimes they would add a new layer to it. Totally. You know, because these things are all worked in pro- works in progress. I mean, um, one of the th- conversations, I'm sorry, this show's going to go long. I hope you guys don't <laughs> mind. Um, one of the things that we talked about at Stanley's Kamikaze on this panel, you've been on this panel before from fan to creator, right, right, right. but I think you and I each did 900 panels this weekend. <laughs> they were you overlapping. were at Stanley's Kamikaze, and we were both double booked on yeah. panels. It was kind of funny. <laughs> but a, a conversation thread that, that came out of one of those panels this weekend was why, why are uh, superhero comics, why are comic books dominating at the box office? Why are they dominating on television? Why is it when you look around you, there's comic book shows everywhere and there's comic book movies everywhere? And I have the answer to this question. It's very simple. One of the weakest parts of any big blockbuster movie is the writing. Hollywood has proven itself at doing a lot of things very well. Special effects, spectacle, marketing, casting, wardrobe, design, music, but the weakest element, literally, if you look at any big blockbuster movie, the weakest thing, the thing that, you know, if, 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 if you're having a bad experience at a movie, it's not because of the sound design. It's not because of, you know, uh, uh, some other element. It's always the writing. And here's where comic books, the advantage of making a comic book film, you, you, you have when you're approaching it is, you have often decades of material to draw from. You've got you know, other minds that have contributed to elements of the character, Tony Stark, right? Which was created in you know, Tales of Suspense in uh, what year, was it 62? 63, 63, like 62, 63. So, so you've got all of these almost, what is it, 50 years, right? 50 years of story material to draw from with Tony Stark, right? So they've had, so, so look, and here's what'll happen. In that time, there'll be a lot of stinkers. There's gonna be some comic books. Read the letters section of any right. comic book. You're, there, there are some really bad stories that we could name for every character that's ever come out. And then out of that, there'll be that issue 48 through 50 of Fantastic Four that we are still talking about today that left an impression. And here's my problem. With that recent Fantastic Four movie, it was based on the Ultimates Fantastic Four, which I didn't think was a very good story. It was not a very good retelling. It didn't have the resonance that the original Fantastic Four origin had over years. So basing it on the Ultimates version, a more serious take on the Fantastic Four, you're basing it on a comic that I didn't think resonated with the with mm-hmm. with the fans of Fantastic Four. It wasn't as a, it didn't it didn't launch the success of comics and a lot of other characters. Well, like Ultimates what you version. were saying, you're saying like so. So what I'm saying is you've got all this vetted history of comic book stories, okay. and that's why comic book movies and TV 
shows are successful. That's but, it. Vetted history of content. I think, but one of the bigger so what things. What is your response to that? Uh, I think it's what you're talking about is started successfully with, I would probably say, Batman Begins. Right. Because everything before right. that, people were not drawing on that rich history of comic right. books. We had things like The Phantom or The Shadow or like, or even Blade. Blade was successful because it was like no one even knew it was a comic book. They right. just thought it was like, wow, that's a cool vampire movie. No one actually, the comic book movies that came out at the time only came out so you know far away from each other. It wasn't like what we have now are four to eight to nine movies every year. Mm -hmm. and, th and a lot of those weren't even based on it. It was like, ah, we'll take that character and, and, and add a new spin to him. And when you really could just be like, what are the best stories that we have to mine from? These characters have so many. So it's like, it is one of those things where you're talking about, the reason I think they went with the Ultimates Fantastic Four is because of the kind of reaction and somewhat, even though those first, two, the first, the Tim Story Fantastic Fours weren't like box office failures, but they were critical failures. Right. So it's one of those things where let's go to this newer version, even though, you know, it's not like the original Fantastic Four, let's try that. So that, that's why I think they were trying to do something, but a lot of interference, a lot of things happened with that new Fantastic Four movie. Obviously, the, was, you know, a lot of things happened with that. I don't think Josh Trank can be blamed for no. the failure of the film. That no. was something, the studio took it away from him early, uh, and and he was not allowed, I mean, it, it, it looks like no one directed it. It really looked like, it looked like it was onto something, mm -hmm. and then all of that was taken away, and it was just shoved through by committee um so i don't i don't think that he can be but and frankly i think that josh trank is the right direction like uh getting a director like him to do something is is making something different like having a different mind so sort of, i it's it was the same philosophy behind getting christopher nolan to do batman right. films let's get an indie director and let's sort of have like that sort of because indie really uh is all about character you know, when you're making an indie movie, you don't have a big budget, and so you put the focus on character and unique people that that in unique situations. But you don't have the budget to actually make spectacle. When you've got the budget to make spectacle, you can still have that indie film feel with the spectacle. But my whole point is, is because these stories are vetted, that's why these stories are so great. Like Chris Nolan must have in the making of. Uh, the Batman Begins thrown down and go what are the greatest moments from the Batman series and what are the unanswered questions and he basically put it in a blender and came up with stuff from The Dark Knight Returns from Batman Year One from you know The Man Who Left right. from from so many different even elements dating back to the very and, first and he, and he went with Ross Al Ghul and the Scarecrow yes. which is, I thought was really daring because those are characters that no one really knows from the Batman, Batman exactly. mythology so yeah, no, really I, 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 yeah, I think that that I, I think that that is the reason. X Men as well, another that was like right? every, no one thought the X Men was even going to make any money. I th they were very scared. That's why they reduced the budget so much for the that first X Men. The they kept one, cutting yeah. it, and Brian Singer was like, "Why are you cutting my budget?" It's the same thing that kind of happened with Fantastic Four. They kept taking scenes and effect scenes and and big scenes away, and. I don't think they had any faith in the X-Men. They didn't know what it was. Most people, that when it came out, were like, what is the X-Men? And then it was such a big hit. And that's when X2 was even a bigger and better film, bigger and better hit. So those kinds of films, the X-Men 2, X-Men 2, and Batman Begins were like just the starting point of these films. And then Iron Man just knocked it out of the park and really once when Kevin Feige came in it was like I've got the plan let's introduce all four of these characters and then make the Avengers and then we got what we wanted since we were kids we got to see an Avengers movie that none of us on the planet ever thought would happen so you know and, and it was a good movie yeah it was really good so now we get to see what a Justice League movie is going to be like in a couple years hopefully Batman v Superman delivers and to get back to flashback, we ta we're Tangent City today on this show. <laughs> I'm um, sorry, that's, I, blame me. Blame no, no. me for that. I I'm will sorry. never blame Chris Gore for yapping for 45 minutes. Oh, dude, um, I'm sorry. I like bringing him on. He just never shuts up. Um, Creeper is going to be a fantastic character if done right. And I think you, you were talking about seeing a Batman R-rated film. This character, I think, I don't think DC is going to play in the R-rated film version with their Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman, but they are in their Vertigo area. So if they were able to take the Creeper out, extricate him and bring him into the Vertigo, maybe. But, you know, he's a weird character, but he could be a horror, like in very easily into the horror realm, I is, think. Is there talk of Suicide Squad being... R because boy that that three minute teaser well, from Com it's looks I'm, borderline R rated. I'm I mean, glad it's you pretty intense. I'm glad you brought up uh, Suicide Squad because actually the Creeper in the comic books is kind of tied in 
Oh, a little really? bit with the sword of katana and certain things where I wouldn't be shocked nor surprised if the creeper comes like a into, cameo. I'm not Cause, kidding. Cause, first of all, that would be awesome because yeah. just to fill out the DC universe, you know, they've yeah. got to kind of play catch up. Yes, with, definitely. You know, they don't I mean, they don't have to do anything with, you know, but but I feel like Suicide Squad could really like we already know who's in it from right. what we've seen. Right. We know Batman's in it in at know. least one scene. So I, I'm, I'm telling you, I think we're going to see those little nods to the nerds like us. Uh, it would be so great, man. I'm really excited about that film. I mean, no, I, I'm, I'm glad it leaked. Uh, yeah. I, I'm glad it came out. Yeah, but. no kidding. That that and There hasn't been an official trailer for it because that really was just a just to sort of show the tone, show that there's something, that, that they're going in this direction. And, well, yeah. and to me, it, it, it just... Gave me faith. Which we is talked about this do. a little bit earlier in the earlier movie talk today, but uh, that they that they were like kind of forced to release that trailer because it leaked online from the mm -hmm. Comic Con was actually a really good thing for D for Warner Brothers and DC. I don't think they really figured it. They thought, all right, it's out. Let's just release. When you it. look at the views. The views oh on Suicide God. Squad are big, bigger than Batman v Superman. Well, and also introduce everyone to the new Joker. And at first, people were like, when you saw that picture with the de deranged and stuff, I liked it. But I know I talked with a lot of people who hated that really hated it and now at kamikaze we saw like 40 jokers all right. with the deranged all with the tattoos all emulating because it's something new and that's the greatest thing about all these characters that are in the pantheon of like dc marvelous they're so well made that they can withstand different writers and artists having different spins and different views and taking those characters you could push those characters as far or as backwards and forwards they're built to last in so many ways so i think this suicide squad is like villains fighting even worse villains it's like <laughs> such a cool concept you know i love it so i'm, I'm looking Can't forward wait. to it we're gonna hit twitter right now you guys tweeted a lot of questions and let's rock on to the first one uh, the first one's from parves for real and he asks why is justice league 2 years apart compared to marvel infinity war and what villains do you think work best so it's kind of a two-part question, but we can weave it in. Chris, what, why, 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 just tell them why you think, like they're, they're having Justice League and that's being separated by two years. Infinity War is coming out back to back. Well, it's Justice League part, you're talking about Justice League part one and Justice yeah. League part two. You know, I, you know I'm sure it's, uh, it's, first of all, getting all of those actors together to make something this big. Right. Um, secondly, two years, look, we, it used to be three years between Star Wars movies, so two years doesn't feel that long to me. Right. In addition, you're going to get movies in between those movies. Yeah. So, um, I, 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 it's who knows, it's a marketing decision. A lot of it is a marketing decision. A lot of it is, I mean, from what I understand, Batman v Superman's done. Right. It could come out. We could it's, have seen it last, like, two months ago. We could have seen it, yeah, exactly. Actually, it's, it's you know, people have talked about in the press, you know, people talked about seeing it. It's been screened since August. People wow. are seeing it. So it's done. Like, like, a lot of this is, like, you know, you're going to release a new product. You've got to get people pumped for it. I know. You know? So, so uh, the two years is really, uh, first of all, and also it's like you got to make a good movie. If you're going to make two really good movies, right. um, I don't think, I, I think that spacing them too close together, I think, uh, the, maybe it's sacrilege to say this, I think Back to the Future 2 and 3 could have just been one movie. Back to the Future 2 and 3 are, 2 and 3 are just not standalone. You need, those are like one movie, right? Yep. I didn't, I don't know that they needed to be two separate films and they came out six months apart and it shows. It shows that like each of them kind of suffered from being weak because they were dependent on the other. Um, I'm hoping, you know, part one and part two isn't some cliffhanger thing. Right. But, but, but if it is, look, it'll be much shorter than having to wait to find out, you know, between Empire and Jedi. Right. That was three years. Exactly. Like, all right. Next question. Olaf Lesniak asks, what did you think about Supergirl now that two episodes are out? Well, we were just kind of covering We, we kind of covered it already. Yeah, so, you know, I haven't seen the second episode, but I really like the first episode. I'm looking forward to every episode not being about the creature from the prison thing that escaped every week. What about you? Yeah, no, I, I like it, except I feel like the first episode focused a little too much on setting up the universe. And also, I feel like it's going to get really... Uh, here's the here's the thing that's going to be a problem for this show, which is the same problem with Gotham. You're going to spend a lot of time writing why Superman isn't in it. There's going to be a lot of references to Superman. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of like, well, Superman could have come in, and why isn't he going after all these criminals that came from Krypton? Like, like I guess is he dealing with his own thing? Who knows? But I feel like there's going to be a lot of time spent writing 
Superman off screen. And I think in Gotham, it's always like writing that there's no Batman and won't be for 10 or 15 years, <laughs> know, right? which is just to me frustrating. I checked out of Gotham after last season. So, um, uh, but you know, I, like, I, I feel like the best part is it. She's the best part. She's the, great. The the she's great. She's charming. She's likable. How do you say I, her name? I, Melissa Benoist or so, yeah. Benoit or something. But I, and I also, I like the guy who plays James Olsen. Right. <laughs> he's got that deep voice. And he's, he's awesome. like, he's got an Instagram and he's like, he's, you know, they make modern references. I like the guy who plays James Olsen. Um, so I, I think there's some good, uh, I, I don't know. They've got like all the elements. I think they just tried to cram too much in the first episode, but let's see how I, we, I, I we should watch, watch flash and Supergirl together. That's we should. Right. All right, we'll do it. All right. Well, next question. We got Felix Tankersley asks thoughts on new reports of iron fist being bumped off the list for Netflix shows and being replaced with the Punisher. What do you think? Anything I think is going to be speculation, so my opinion is yeah. irrelevant. Uh, you know, I think I think if they make that kind of choice, that's I mean, that's up to them. But it's really I like would, the question know? is like, who do you like better as a character, Iron Fist or the Punisher? What would you well, rather? I don't watch? know. I like I like John Bernthal, but I also like uh, the actor who's playing Iron Fist. Why am I spacing on his name? It's not Ryan Philippe. Have they announced him yet? No, no, no. Well, no, there are rumors of, of, of casting for that. But What's the rumor that you heard? There, uh, Ryan Felipe. So, yeah. yeah. We don't know, and neither have like we. Him. We haven't officially said that Ryan Philippe is playing Iron Fist, so you haven't heard it here first. Next week's Twitter yes, question. Right. What do you think, think of good. Ryan Felipe We're, playing Iron where Fist? Where did I hear that he was all the, playing? All these speculation yeah. questions are just speculation. Yeah. It doesn't matter what we say. Yeah, but as, in, as far as your opinion, who do you like better, Iron Fist or The Punisher? Comic books. Uh, comic books, I probably like The Punisher. Right. So, so there you go. That's your answer. I kind of I kind of like the Punisher better, but if it's Luke Cage, Power Man and Iron Fist together, that's I think that cool. would be fantastic. And yeah. if they're going to do that, I think, you know, I think they're doing a really good job with the Netflix series so far. Like everything I've seen from Jessica Jones looks really fun and different from Daredevil. And, uh, you know, Luke Cage is going to be pretty awesome as far as I understand. And we know like the one cool thing I do like about the Netflix, you know, what we've seen of Daredevil and and what we saw last season with Daredevil and Jessica Jones, it looks amazing. Like it yeah. was announced, I believe today that Netflix is spending $5 billion on content for next year. Like they've just greenlit productions that will, that will cost $5 billion, which makes me think we're giving them a lot of money. Like how many <laughs> subscribers right. do they have <laughs> and how much money is Netflix making worldwide? It's insane. But, the, but that's the one thing about, about Daredevil. Um, I mean, it looked great. It felt epic. It felt like they spent, um, a uh, 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 money on it, you know. It didn't look cheap or feel right. like they were feel like they were writing around the fact that they didn't have money, which I felt like in every Fantastic Four movie. Right. I feel like they've always written around the fact that they can't do the big thing. They but really you know what's do. fun about Daredevil? I still, sorry to admit, I still am, I've got three episodes left. I still have been savoring oh it. Oh my god! I know I've not seen the last. I, I haven't seen him in the weird red outfit. He's still in the black outfit right now. But you know what I like most about Daredevil mm. is the way it's written. Yes. It's like it's like it doesn't matter if they even have money or not. It's just such a well-written, well-cast so well show, written. well shot, it's well directed, it's really fun. I mean, it's like And, and you that's care about me. the side characters. Yeah, Foggy, man. I love Foggy. Yeah, at first I didn't like him. The first couple episodes, I don't know if I like this Foggy. And then by the middle of it, I was like, I do like Foggy. Yeah, like, yeah, I don't Foggy's want bad cool. things to happen to Foggy. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. or Karen. So I'm like, hey, we'll see. I haven't <laughs> finished the series yet. So let's go on to the next uh, question. It's NJRW asks, Hey John, could Shazam be a woman? Or is the character always male? Well, so far, like in the DC world, DC 52, and a lot of these other newer versions, they've made every single character who's not a main character or woman. They've done it with the question. They've done it with Dr. Fate. A lot of DC and Marvel characters, they do that flip. They're like, now Thor's a woman. Check it out. But Bang. didn't they already have like Shazam family? They do. Captain they, Marvel it was, family uh, I think her name was uh, Mary Marvel. Yeah, that's it. Yes. And yeah. they had the like, kid Shazam or Shazam Jr. I can't remember the blue, yeah, yeah. blue guy, the blue kid. Right, 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 yeah, right. So, kid yeah, they, Shazam. Yeah, baby Shazam or the whatever. The worst thing, <laughs> which I, you know, as a kid always annoyed me and I was offended by, is when they would always take uh, an act or an actor they would take um someone who was black and they would just name it like look it's black lightning it's black that oh, i right. always hated that well you know what i mean they did it with I, I, they did it with uh, black panther me. black panther was the first one well, he has a black costume right. i guess and it's it, fine but i but like it would just always bug me when they would just have and they would do this both dc and marvel universe did it right. where they would just like well he's black this 
Lazy. That's lazy. It's lazy. And also it was a different time period. It was, it was a like different we time. Lived in a, that was a weird world. So yeah. thank God we don't have that world anymore. But now we're getting a lot of cool yes, stuff. Yes, everything has been solved when That's it right. comes to racism. I know, right. Or, and, and or it's all been solved. Or feminism. All, yeah. So I think Shazam, feminism, sh Shazam yeah. should be a woman. They haven't even... Shazam's coming up in like, what, four years? I think DC should make Shazam a woman. They've already... The Rock is in... He's playing Black Adam and we've right, been right. announced that for like six years now. When are they going to make Shazam? I just think I just think uh, like that's why I don't have a problem with like Michael B. Jordan being cast as like uh, Johnny Storm Human Torch. Mm -hmm. He was not the problem with that movie. He's great actually, right. and I can't wait to see him in Creed. Not a superhero film. Sorry, folks. Right. It's a movie. It's in the Rocky verse, which is another one of those connected universes. I feel like gonna say, fans are going to be like Creed. He's from Spawn. I'd it's like, like a someone, giant creature. I'd like to see a fan theory <laughs> where someone says all of the Stallone characters are part of the Stallone verse. Hey. Cobra. <laughs> <laughs> Rocky, they're all in one universe. I love that idea. Stallone, yeah. if you're watching this, I think you should create, well, Chris just helped you create the stallone -iverse. The stallone -iverse. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, so I, those, all those things never bother me. Um, the, the the original source material uh, is still still exists. So uh, philosophically speaking, you, are, you and I are on the same page with that. Yeah. And it does get really boring a lot of times to watch a bunch of white guys all the time. Yeah. This well, show. Go, let, hey. As hey, an example. Come on. You guys aren't bored. <laughs> Next question. We got Steve Rogers. Captain America just wrote in. He asked, do you think explaining a tired origin story, Spider-Man, in a movie trailer would work? So, like, not even having it in the movie, just show the trailer of, like, say, like, a character like Iron Fist. Just show the trailer, but then that's not any part of the movie. I guess that's the question. There's Don't actually have it in the movie, but show it as part of the trailer. Well, um... I don't think that will ever happen, and right. I'll tell you why. When Sam Raimi was making the original Spider-Man with uh, Tobey Maguire, um, which I thought was a great origin story, um, he was just begging for money on that film. I mean, it didn't look like you know it was anemic budget-wise, but he really was starving for cash on that film. And Sony took two million dollars, hired some commercial director, and created this trailer that has a bank robbery. See, tell me if you remember this. Mm -hmm. A bank robbery, and the, the bank robbers take off. And it's a long trailer. It's like a three-minute trailer. And a helicopter. Trailer, and a helicopter mm -hmm. gets trapped in a web between the Twin Towers. And because of what happened on 9-11, which happened between when the trailer came out and that movie coming out, yep. because of what happened at 9-11, that trailer was shelved. I'm sure you can find it on the internet because the internet... Everything exists. Right. But th the fact that they took $2 million away from Sam Raimi, who needed money to make that film, to make a standalone trailer for something that ended up not being in the movie, makes no sense. Unless it's something like that Deadpool trailer where he's just talking to the camera, right. which I thought was really funny, and which clearly is like about the trailer and stuff. Like, Of course, but that's just him talking. It's right. not like a big budget thing. So I don't think that's ever going to happen. It's a clever concept. I would like to see less... Or I mean, it wasn't Kevin Feige who said we're not going to be really doing origin stories anymore. Right. And the origins you can do in a five-minute flashback. Like, yeah. or you know, I, I like that idea that like there have been you know, other origins and other heroes. In, in Ant-Man, we discovered that there was another Ant-Man and Wasp that existed pulling secret missions we didn't even know about. And actually, we were talking about that. Um, Ant-Man and the Wasp, they could actually show another one of the versions of their secret missions that they went on. They could have the original Ant-Man right. and the Wasp and then now the new Ant-Man and the Wasp. They right. could, like, they, we could get both of both uh. worlds. It would be fantastic. Sweaty question of the week goes to Brennan Corley, who asks, will we see a Batman v Superman movie reference in the Flash show like in a Flash 1990, or will they be in the same universe? What do you think? Well, the one cool thing about the Flash, I'm not sure if you're you're not there yet because you're not on. Season but I've two. already read about they've got the multiverse. Yeah. yeah, they've got the multiverse, and I think it was was it Jeff Johns who said that basically, well, the movie is one Earth, and the television shows, all of the other DC television shows, is a different Earth. Um, I don't think there's going to be a reference at all. I'm not sure that they actually need it or it's necessary. I feel like they're standalone things. I think the tone of what's, what's happening with the Flash TV show is completely different than what they're going for with the DC movie right. universe. So um, I, the answer to that is no. Right. I would say no. Um, it would be nice if everyone could play along 
Uh, but I don't think that that's going to be the case when it comes to these DC properties. And I don't have a problem with it. I like that it's like, that's a great explanation that it's like they're just different Earths and different mm -hmm. multiverse. Um, in fact, there was something that came out in science like this week. I know about there. I have to love Some science, guy was like, like tracking like like things from the Big Bang. He was like, obviously these, these things I'm tracking were kind of emanating stronger, signaling to me that they are coming they were coming from one of the bubble ult, bubble multiverses that exist so supposedly our universe is a bubble and we're next to a whole bunch of other bubbles, bubbles? yeah that are that's what the multiverses are wow. the, our universe does actually end and is actually like one giant bubble and we're filled with bubbles that's right and then bubbles it's just and a, bubbles and, and bubbles. just like a molecule and there's bill, trillions and trillions that's right. yeah well you know what i like about the marvel universe mm -hmm. the way that they're like they're incorporating Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and all these other TV shows in a very subtle way where you're not going to see characters from the movie universe kind of integrated. It might just be like like you've seen, like Sam Jackson's in one episode or like there's Sif. Or they do that kind of thing where it's the movies are kind of following. I mean, the TV shows are kind of following along with the movie sub, sub stories. I think with, with DC, they've decided to like, look, the movie universe is separate. Then we've got, you know, our Earth 1, Earth 2, or Earth A, or Earth B, or whatever, however they want to explain it, which gives them a little bit more freedom to do what they want with the TV shows and not worry about how it ties in with the movies. So, henceforth, like, Avengers, Age of Ultron, and, you know, it's like, in Avengers, you know, Coulson dies, and now he's a main character in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. What, how does that relate to the rest Coulson's of the world? I don't think Coulson's ever going to come back. Just to stop you on Twitter from sending this question, Coulson's never going to come back in the movie universe. It's just not going to happen. Unless in Infinity Wars, there's a way he could come back, hmm. I think. Wow. All right. Well, I guess we'll be seeing Infinity Wars in 40, 45 years. Or when no, does no, it come no. out? It's 2019 and 2020. Isn't okay. that it? Am I wrong? Is that right? 2019 and 2020, I believe. They, they, Infinity Wars Part 1 and Part 2. All right. Well, I, that, I'm, that's not that far away. We'll, yeah. we'll be seeing them. 2018 and 2019. Yeah, we've got Civil War. That's coming out next year. Okay. So, and that wraps it up for this uh, episode of Heroes 31. Thanks for sticking around. Guest starring Chris Gore. Where can we find you online, Chris? Uh, you can find me at uh, chrisgore.com. Follow me on Twitter at that Chris Gore. And if you like interesting photographs, follow me on Instagram at, at that Chris Gore. Awesome. Thanks for being on the show. You can Thank follow you. me at uh, on Instagram and Twitter, just at John Schnepp or at TDOSLWH. You can get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, by going to www.tdoslwh.com. Get a digital download. Support independent film. I'm John Schnepp. I'll see you next week on Collider Heroes. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.